Hello, I'm Hannah Kay, and welcome to this Intelligence Squared event with Coleman Hughes and Kenan Malik. It was recorded here in London last week when Coleman was over from New York. And they were talking about Kenan's new book, Not So Black and White, which is a history of the ideas of race. And it is really brilliantly researched and utterly fascinating. Highly recommended. Coleman is the host of the award-winning podcast, Conversations with Coleman, and you can find out more about his work at colemanhughes.com. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Ken and Malik, thanks so much for coming on my show. Pleasure. And we are simultaneously airing this with Intelligence Squared, so welcome to that audience as well. And the subject of today's conversation is your wonderful book called Not So Black and White. And the uh, first question I want to ask you is just a little bit about you before we get into the topic. What brought you to the topic of race? And maybe say, say a little bit about how you came to be interested in the subject. Well, it's impossible for someone like me, a um, brown person in, in, in Britain, not to be um, brought into the topic of race. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I live the topic of race. But I came to Britain when I was about six. And the Britain I grew up in was very different from the Britain it is today. In those days, racism was vicious, um, uh, visceral, in a way that's barely imaginable now. Um, racist attacks were daily. You know, it's hard to think of a, of a time I didn't come back from school having been in a fight. Mm -hmm. um, racism drew me into politics. I got involved in a whole host of campaigns um, about deportations, about racist attacks, about um, racism in the workplace and so on. But if it was racism that drew me into politics, it was politics that made me see beyond racism, mm. to see um, that there were broader issues of social justice and that um, thinking about social justice simply in terms of my experiences was insufficient um, I came to read people like Marx and Mill, um, Baldwin and Arendt, um, who drew me into an entirely different universe. I, mm. I began to see um, uh, the world in a, in, a, in, a different, in a different way. And it was at that time, um, the left was still what one might call the universalist left. There were still universalist strands to um, the idea that uh, what we were fighting for uh, was not simply shaped by one's identity, but had um, was about creating coalitions and movements that went across identities, um, and that it is only in transforming everybody's lives that one gets to transform one's own life. Um, you know, within about this, this, we're talking about here about the early 1980s, mm -hmm. but within about a decade, much of that had changed. That um, the the left became much more rooted in identitarian notions. The the, the big issue for me was the Salman Rushdie campaign mm -hmm. um, in 1988, 1989, um, which um, where. A lot of my friends who'd been on the left um, suddenly became opponents of Rushdie, uh, thought he, the satanic verses should be censored, um, supported the, the burning of the book. Um, and it got me to thinking about what had happened, why that was the case, why the left has changed so much. Um, and it got me thinking about identitarian politics, and that's uh, what I've been thinking about and arguing against for the best part of 30 years. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting about this is is I, I'm American and and you're, you grew up in Manchester and have lived in London for a very long time. And there are striking similarities between how the conversation has evolved in America and in Britain. We've seen the same move from a universalist left uh, from a left in America that could really claim to live by Martin Luther King's, you know, universalist message of we are all brothers, 
in Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, black nor white, he would say things like that, to a, a left that is much more focused on, as you call it, stay in your lane arguments, which I think is a great summary of the ethos of the left, right? If you're black, stay in your black lane. If you're white, stay in your white lane. If you're Mexican, stay, you know, that, that we all have these racial lanes and, and roles to play and beliefs and politics that come sort of as a package deal with the race or ethnicity that you're born into. And that's often called identity politics. Uh, there are also differences, though, between America and, and the UK. One, which is that uh, in America, we had you know, slavery within our own borders. And, you know, often that historical episode is at the center of some of our uh, deepest controversies. Um, and the, the other difference is that we've long been a nation of immigrants, a nation with massive immigration in the mid 19th century. Um, and, and so I guess the pattern of immigration and backlash and more immigration and backlash is old, is very old in America, but it's, I think it's newer, um, in, in the UK. I'm curious how you view the differences between America and the UK when it comes to the issue of racial identity. I think one of the problems we have is that, um, because of the economic, social, cultural heft of America. What happens in America tends to shape what happens elsewhere. So attitudes about race, arguments about race in America are simply taken on and applied uh, to other countries where they're less applicable. Um, one of the reasons um, that the book concentrates on America is precisely that, that um, because the, the, the arguments about race in America are, are so influential uh, to the rest of the world that, um, that it's important to, to challenge it in its own terms, uh, to unpick them, um, and therefore to uh, show why they're, they're, they're not so applicable, not just in, in the rest of the world, but to America itself. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the identitarian strain is probably much stronger in America than it is elsewhere. I mean, mm -hmm. you can see it elsewhere, but it is probably much stronger in America. Um, and to me, to explain the, the shift to an identitarian turn, you have to understand two things. Firstly, that anti-racist movements, anti-colonial movements have always had an identitarian aspect to them. Um, there's always been a tension within um, anti-racist movements um, between identitarian and universalist perspectives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go back to the 19th century and you have the Back, back to Africa movements in America. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have Marcus Garvey in the early 20th century, negritude, pan-Africanism and so on. Mm -hmm. So that, those have always been there. But not till relatively recently have they become the dominant force within um, anti-racist discourse. And the reason they've become the dominant force ha is, I think, to do with the social pessimism that has developed over the last uh, half century. To, to, to adopt a universalist perspective, to think that you can build coalitions across the fissures of race and class and ethnicity and so on, to think that you can radically transform society requires a certain degree of optimism, social optimism. And much of that has ebbed over the last uh, uh, half century. So more and more people cling on to what they have. They cling on to their particular identity, their particular, the boxes into which we've been put. And, and see the world more and more through those identities, through those boxes. So I think it's important to, 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 to locate where we are. Um, it's not as if we've suddenly become all identitarian. It's always been there. Mm -hmm. But that the wider shifts, the wider economic, political, social shifts, um, and in particular the way that um, the labour movement has lost uh, influence, has lost force over the past half century, has played a, an important part in, in, in what we're seeing now. So let's rewind um, 
a lot of your book deals with the history of the idea of race. Mm -hmm. This idea of of humanity being separated into five or six distinct groups, that concept has not been around forever. It has an origin story like any other idea does. And, and so I'm curious, uh, in your view, when did the idea of race begin and how did it evolve from its first state into what it is today? That's obviously a very big question. I make the argument that, and lots of people have made this argument, of course, that race is a product of modernity. Um, it's not that in, pre in the pre-modern world there wasn't bigotry or there wasn't a sense, uh, a belief that other groups may have been subhuman. Um, there wasn't uh, uh, a lack of huge intolerance um, against other groups. Clearly there was. But there w what there wasn't was a sense that um, humans were equal and there was a single universal uh, uh, sense of humanity. That was what developed largely in the 18th century. Um, we think about the Enlightenment and Enlightenment notions of equality and universalism. And against the background of societies that broadly accept the idea of equality, of universality, the notion of race, racism, the notion of um, inequality, racial inequality, becomes something very different. Um, what you have from the, from the late 18th century onwards is our, our societies um, that are rooted in the idea that all humans are equal, all men are equal as the American Declaration of, of Independence broadly says, mm -hmm. um, or the uh, French uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man, which mm -hmm. broadly says uh, much the same. Um, so the idea of equality becomes a defining feature of uh, post-Enlightenment societies, uh, Western societies. But that um, abstract belief in equality is set against the practice of inequality, the social practice of inequality, of enslavement, of um, the refusal to uh, grant uh, rights to women, to um, minorities, to uh, working class, and so on. And race develops in the modern world um, out of that contradiction, as a way of almost of making sense of that contradiction, that race becomes a way of saying um, certain people are by nature unequal. Um, and therefore not deserving or not worthy of equality. Um, and that became an explanation for slavery, for instance. Mm -hmm. it black people, the ancestors of today's African-Americans, weren't enslaved because they were black. Slavery has existed well before modernity. Um, and it, and, it in, and it, both blacks and whites were enslaved in those days. So the, the ancestors of today's African-Americans weren't enslaved because they were black, but they came to be deemed as racially distinct and racially inferior as black people as a way of justifying their, their enslavement. So race becomes a means of, of explaining and justifying the, the continuation of inequalities in societies that had that had proclaimed their, their fidelity to equality. And what's important to recognise is how different, say, 19th century views of race were than um, contemporary views of race. We think of race largely in terms of skin colour or continent of origin, black, mm -hmm. white, Asian, and so on. Mm -hmm. Whereas for 19th century thinkers, race was primarily... Uh, a description of social inequalities. So yes, black people, Asians, Chinese, Indians, and so on, were, were seen as inferior, but so was the working class. I mean, it may be difficult to, 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 to comprehend now, but 19th century thinkers saw factory workers and, and uh, farmhands 
as racially distinct from themselves mm -hmm. as many see white and black um, uh, as racially distinct. Um, and their inability to be any more than factory workers or farmhands was attributed to the fact that they were racially inferior. Yeah. So there's a few things there. One is the difference between an ethnic group and a race. There, as you point out in the book, at that time, ethnic groups often viewed themselves and talked about themselves as distinct races. Um, you know, people that would be considered the same race today, like the, the Irish and the British or the Normans and, um, you know, the Gauls, people that would all be described today or seen as, as white at the time had, you know, bitter hostility, rivalries, and conceptions of themselves as different races. On the other hand, I do feel that there is a difference between ethnic differences and, and racial differences, which is that the more that people look very different um, at a glance, the easier it is for those hostilities to persist over very long periods of time, and, and the harder it is for groups to truly meld into one. So for example, the Enlightenment thinkers, some of the Enlightenment thinkers that I admire, and I'm sure you do too, like Frederick Douglass, one of the major things they were wrong about in, in the case of Douglass is that they thought by now there would be no such thing as black people and white people, that we would have intermarried and intermingled to such a point where we would all kind of look like a fairly undifferentiated mass. Yet, the, the patterns of people looking different and, and, and you know, uh, based on where their ancestors are from has persisted to, to a degree that they didn't predict, right? Um, and it seems to me, you know, when we talk about how ethnic groups in the American case, which I know the most about, such as Irish Americans, Italian Americans, Polish Americans, etc., by now, white Americans my age, they don't, most of them don't care where their ancestors are from. They're just vaguely European. I don't really care. And the white identity has subsumed all of these formerly super important differences. Whereas the difference between white and black as a socially important category has, has remained. And it seems to me the key difference, it's, it's not that, it's not that, uh, for instance, the bitterness between you know, the Irish and British were any less real. They're, they're, you know, huge. But it's that when people look the same, or not the same, but when people look ra rather similar, it's easier for, for them to blend over the course of hundreds of years um, in a way that it, it just is harder when there are actual, uh, you know, color differences. Does that seem like a, a fair analysis to you? I've, there are a number of points here. The first is that if you go back to the 19th century, people saw the Irish or the working class as physically distinct. Sure. Um, you know, in a way, we would find it absurd today. Um, that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, the, it's not purely the question of looking different um, that's at issue here. But it is true that... that, um, that the fact that black people are easily distinguishable from whites plays an important part in this. One of the reasons um, that slavery was racialized, for instance, at the end of, say, the, the 17th century, early 18th century, was that there were continual um, struggles against both slavery and indentured servitude, which is what um, white, poor whites faced in, 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 in America um, in those days, um, that blacks and whites used to get together and, 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 and challenge their um, enslavement or, or servitude. And that uh, it became easier, it was a lot easier to distinguish, um, say, a runaway slave if that slave was black than mm -hmm. if that slave was white. And so, um, partly to, to, to break up that coalition between blacks and whites, um, slavery became increasingly racialized. You can see that in America at the end of the 19th century too, when you had, in the post-reconstruction world, you had the fusion movements between 
uh, poor whites and, and, and blacks, um, which challenged the, the, the elite, um, particularly in the South, in uh, North and South Carolina, in um, uh, Virginia and so on, um, challenged them um, by, by presenting a, a broader, a more equal notion of what kind of society they want to live in. They, they, um, they challenged particularly the, the Democrats, who were, who were the elites and the, and the pro-slavery um, party in, in the South. Um, and in order to break up that coalition against, quite deliberately, in order to break up that coalition between uh, whites and blacks, um, Jim Crow was introduced in a most ferocious way to allow for certain types of privileges for whites and to segregate uh, blacks. Um, and so you can see how racism becomes uh, a means of, uh, of breaking up uh, cross-racial cross coalitions, class coalitions um, against the elite. The idea of, going back to, 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 your, to your argument about, uh, about skin colour, it's only in the early 20th century that whiteness as we understand it and blackness as we understand it became consolidated. Um, that what you call ethnic groups, um, the Irish, the Slavs and so on, um, was see, became seen as whites um, and that the major division was purely between uh, black and white. Um, and there were two reasons for that. One was the extension, expansion of democracy within Western nations, so that um, the working class, which had largely been excluded from the democratic process, were now brought in, um, uh, given the vote, brought into the democratic process. And it became much more difficult to talk about the working class as racially uh, inferior um, when they're part of the democratic process. Mm -hmm. And the second reason was the expansion of imperialism, the new imperialism the scramble for Africa um, from the 1880s uh, onwards. Um, so so that, uh, the scramble for Africa uh, divided up Africa among the European nations. Um, America seized uh, uh, parts of the Pacific uh, and so on. Um, and that's, uh, that new imperialism redrew what uh, Du Bois calls the colour line um, and made race much more what, as we see it now, um, as an uh, uh, issue of race, uh, issue of skin colour, of a black and white issue um, than it had been previously. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me when there is that skin color difference there always when there's always something visual to appeal to for the people that want to divide uh you know for whatever reason the ability to point to a vis a visual difference is an immense tool in the in the in the hands of racists where uh where you know just if there isn't that kind of difference i mean so so for example in, in America, there's quite a big cultural difference and historical difference between black Americans who descend from slavery, like me, and recent African immigrants. Um, not only is there somewhat of a difference in, in appearance, there is a difference in cultural heritage and all kinds of stuff. In any other situation, these, these would be groups that you would expect to just conceive of themselves as just like two different groups of people and you know whatever comes along with that but because there is a color similarity over time you do see like a to some extent a kind of merging um and it wouldn't surprise me if a few generations down the line you have recent african immigrants simply conceiving of them of themselves as african americans and, and we've already seen that with like immigrants from the west indies so that assimilation which has become a bit of a dirty word uh, for for some people, but that uh, that that process of two groups that view themselves as different eventually coming to view themselves as the same, uh, 
it seems is enabled or made easier by kind of visual similarity. Um, and that's a, like I said, I think that was one thing that even some of the brightest enlightenment thinkers maybe did not predict sufficiently. Quite often though, we impose um, the idea that people look dissimilar when we put people into separate categories. Jews, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, people are sure they can tell a Jew um, uh, because they're belonging to a different category. One of the, um, the fact that anti-Semitism um, continues, despite most Jews being visually not that dissimilar to um, the, the population in which they live, is uh, an aspect of uh, the way we categorise people without necessarily there being uh, visual markers. I mean, we impose visual markers, or racists impose visual markers on Jews, but that's not mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, and it's true that um, that the kind of black-white difference has come to predominate uh, much of our thinking. Um, but it's interesting how those categories work. For instance, many now look at Latinos in America as white um, and talk about multicultural whiteness, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, because they or, or, or look at Asians as surrogate whites. Mm -hmm. um, because what's important are, is not actually the, the physical distinction. People can tell the difference if, if, if they wish between um, white Americans and uh, Asian Americans but, or Latinos. Um, but what matters is the, the kind of story you say, you tell about, about, about different groups and the categories into which you put those groups. Um, and yes, the, the difference between um, immigrants from Africa or from the Caribbean and African uh, African Americans is is uh, can be quite large mm -hmm. in terms of um, their place in society, the kinds of jobs they have, the wealth they possess, and so on. All, all those kinds of the degree of poverty and so on. Um, this it's similar in in Europe too. Mm -hmm. uh, you have similar kind of distinctions between. Um, uh, uh, African Caribbeans in 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 Britain and and uh, African migrants, um, but because we have this notion of blackness, um, every everything gets elided into a single category, and it's the way we look at the world and the way we categorise the world, um, more uh, as much as any kind of visual distinction that is important. I think. Mm. So, a topic that I've talked about and just wrote a column about for the free press is the notion of colorblindness. And uh, this is something I think is widely misunderstood and maligned. I think, um, you know, colorblindness is often summarized as just this idea that you're gonna, we're going to pretend not to notice race and then racism is going to disappear. And... No doubt there have been some people that express that kind of idiotic or naive, let's say, take. But I think properly understood, colorblindness is really just a commitment to try your very best to not treat people according to their race and to also enshrine that principle in our politics. Like, we want to get to a place, I'll speak for myself, I want to get to a place where we are not thinking about putting racial categories into law or into policy for any reason. Obviously, societies have done this for just plain old bigoted reasons, but we also do this in America, certainly, for reasons of quote-unquote social justice. Um, you know, in my view, almost anything you want to achieve in the name of uh, increasing e e equality reducing the difference between the haves and the have-nots can be done on the basis of a metric like income or, or class more precisely and more justly and more rationally than it could be done on the basis of we're going to separate people by race and give uh, whatever resources to this race o over that race. We're going to do some kind of racial triage. Um, so 
I'm just teeing up that concept for you of colorblindness, right? How do you understand colorblindness? And do you think that it is, uh, in general, a good value to promote? Do you think it's something that's naive and should be relegated to the dustbin of history? I think colorblindness has, has, has come to be a, a kind of um, shorthand for a form of liberal universalism. Um, and I think that's what it's it's come to mean for many people. And, uh, and at one level, uh, you'd say it, 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 this: it's what you want to, uh, to 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 go towards. That um, the idea that uh, you have a world in which race or colour doesn't matter. Part of the problem, though, I think, is that universalism itself comes in different forms. And um, historically, as I show in the book, there, there's a distinction between um, liberal and radical forms of universalism. And liberal universalists were often attached, um, had, had an attachment to universalism, but were often um, willing to, to, to accept, accede uh, to um, all forms of discriminatory practices. Um, whereas... It, it it was those who challenged um, not just racism but 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 the whole social structure which gave gave rise to racism. Um, the radical universalists um, who took that argument further. So, for instance, um, uh, to give a historical in, in, uh, example, the, the Haitian Revolution is to me hugely important. Um, the Haitian Revolution is the third great revolution of the, of, of the 18th century. But compared to the American and French, we barely know about it. Um, but it was a Haitian Revolution where slaves on the French island of Saint-Domingue um, challenged first their enslavement and then created uh, the, the, um, the new nation of Haiti and in the process um, defeated the armies of France and Britain and Spain and so on. What um, what the the Haitian Revolution showed was that was that first, but it was showed they showed both the importance and the shortcomings of Enlightenment notions of universalism, because the French revolutionaries um, who who had created the French Revolution on the basis of the rights of man, of universal rights, nevertheless are willing to accept slavery and colonialism. And it, and it was only through the, um, the, the, the actions of the enslaved on Saint-Domingue that uh, slavery was at first overthrown. Uh, and that, in a sense, they forced French revolutionaries to take their own ideals seriously. Mm -hmm. So... We're not debating the ideals. The ideals are, are, are important. Um, but how you challenge them and how you go about it is, um, is also important. So, if you, again, it, it, historically, um, if you go back, if you take a figure like uh, John Stuart Mill, kind of the great Victorian um, defender of liberalism, he was also a defender of colonialism. Um, whereas the radical universalists in, in Britain at that time, um, where Mill defended um, the East India Company and, 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 and the um, uh, colony and the Britain uh, colonising India, the radical universalists challenged um, that very idea, defended the rights of Indians to their own nation in the same way as they defend the rights of Poles or Hungarians and so on. And so, and in a sense, that comes through today as well, because one can think about colour blindness or, or a liberal universalist perspective um, from an individualist uh, viewpoint, or one can think of it from a collective viewpoint. And if we're going to think that the relationship between race and class is important and that class um, plays an important part of our, of, of our struggle to create a, a better world, then we, ha we can't think about um, colour blindness in an individualist sense 
but only in, in the sense of a collective struggle to transform the world. And part of the problem, I think, with the, the colorblindness perspective today is that it is rooted in, in, a, in a form of individualism that doesn't allow us to, to challenge and change the world. So I'm, I'm detecting like a, an undercurrent of, uh, of class politics in your perspective. Have you ever been a Marxist? Are you, do you think of yourself as a Marxist or, or have you ever thought of yourself that way? Oh, I was, I was with, um, in a number of far left organizations back in the eighties in, in my youth. Um, I, 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 class is, is important and shapes the way, um, much of the world is. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you, if you look at everything from health disparities to, uh, uh, to, um, disparities of income to to take an issue in America um, the, 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 the mass incarceration um, of, of people in America he can, do, he can um, explain mass incarceration in America actually far better um, by class than he can by race I mean there, there's a lot of discussion of mass incarceration as the new Jim Crow mm -hmm. in America as you know um, the the, the, the the name of Michel Alexander's book, but it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a much older idea. But if you actually look at look look at the the the, the, the figures, um, you find that incarceration rates are defined by um, income and by class than much more than they are by race. At every income level, the incarceration rates of blacks and whites are almost the same. Whereas mm -hmm. across um, income levels, um, there are huge disparities. So yes, class is hugely important. Um, and I think that challenging uh, racism also requires us to challenge um, the class disparities and the, and the class uh, the, um, differentials that, that exist in society. So in my view, one of the, the great failures of Marxism over the many, many decades has been its... Uh, it's sense that it would be easy to, to for for you know the workers of the world to unite across racial and ethnic lines. Uh, the sense that if we just you know agitate and argue in the right way, people will really see that the poor of the world, of different races that speak different languages and different ethnicities, different cultures, will unite against the bourgeoisie and and um, create a better world. And in my view, maybe this was not a ridiculous assumption, but it certainly hasn't been borne out. You see, I mean, over and over again, you see how easy it is for people at the top to, you know, quote unquote, divide and conquer, um, to, to pit different ethnic group, groups of poor people against one another. And um, you know, prevent that kind of formation of a common cause, it proves extraordinarily easy just over and over again in different societies. And, and so I'm curious, what, what do you make of that as someone who, I guess, used to be, broadly speaking, a Marxist, but also promotes a kind of universalism? Well, Marxism uh, promotes a kind of universalism. Um, uh, so that that's not the distinction in a sense. So what do you um, make yes, of the, of the, the practical uh, failure to achieve that kind of aim? The the um, it's true that uh, there are it's been very easy to break um, cross racial class coalitions mm -hmm. um, through the use of ideas of race or ethnicity and so on. That doesn't mean that the aim is, is false or wrong. It just means that it is very difficult to do so, or it, it becomes very easy to break those kinds of cl class coalitions. And if, in fact, um, uh, uh, cross-racial co class coalitions. And in fact, that, what that sh shows is the importance of um, creating th those kinds of coalitions, the importance of uh, arguing against and 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 taking a stand, a not just arguing against, but taking a practical stance 
against um, those kinds of divisions that are imposed upon us. Um, and the fact that those kinds of cross-racial coalitions do exist and have existed historically um, shows what may be possible um, and what is possible. So uh, in America, the, um, the, the fusion movements, as I was talking about in the, in, in the, in the late 19th century, uh, the, the way that um, the famous New, or New Orleans general strike, 1892, where blacks and whites came together uh, to take on employers. The, the work of um, uh, the, what, what, what we now call civil rights unionism in the interwar years, um, which brought together the struggle of uh, blacks and the struggle of, work, of, work, of workers and brought them together in, in, the, in a single struggle and, and saw them as part of the, of the same um, challenge to, uh, to, to inequity. So all those things show, um, or, or in Britain, if you, if, you want, if you want to look in Britain, um, the support that um, Lancashire cotton workers gave to uh, the American North during the Civil War, um, or the Grumwick strike, the famous Grumwick strike in the 1970s, where um, a group of Asian women uh, went out on strike and were supported by thousands upon thousands of workers across uh, the country. Mm -hmm. um, all those things show the, possibi the possibilities of such coalitions, um, what is possible. Um, so, in a sense, uh, while it is easy, and it has been his, his, his easy to... Um, to break such coalitions down, to use ideas of race and ethnicity and gender and so on, to break down those, those coalitions. Um, that only shows that um, how, what um, the problems of, of, of thinking of our, of our struggles in those terms, in identitarian terms. Mm -hmm. And it shows even more that the necessity going beyond identitarian terms, um, identity and categories, um, to, to create those, those wider um, uh, coalitions and struggles. So in your book, you basically, you know, it seems like there's this dividing line. And on one side of it is all of the race-based politics of history and the present, which is, you know, in the past and to some degree still in the present, would be white supremacy and white identity politics, and also black identity politics and uh, minority identity politics in general. And then on, on the other side of that dividing line is a universalist message that we are all the same race. There's only one race, the human race, and the politics of identity and race in, in general are to be avoided uh, because of their divisiveness, their reliance on this social construct, and so forth. Some people would take issue with that history because they would not want white identity politics and black identity politics to be put on the same side of any line. They would say, no, actually, the history should be written this way. It should be written the bad kinds of identity politics, white racism, etc., are on one line, and all the good kinds are 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 virtuous and um, are fighting against the evil. This is a simple story of good versus evil, and the universalist, colorblind sort of message is is some third category, right? So how would you respond to that critique of the way that you are writing history? I think the, the idea that there is good identity politics and bad identity politics, and, and um, you can define these things as good identity politics, these things as bad identity politics, um, simply misunderstands the problem. Hmm. There's, there has, as, as, I, I, I don't think it's as simple as, as, as you are posing it, that there is identity politics on this side and universalist politics on the other, and that, that's always been the case historically. Historically, um, all, all struggles against race against colonialism and so on 
have embodied in, in, a, a sense of both. There's always been um, uh, uh, identitarian strains um, in those struggles, and there've always been universalist strains in those struggles. And and until recently, the universalist uh, aspects of those struggles was the dominant one. But it's, but it's not to say that they were kind of completely separate. Um, the way I'd look at it is this, that people don't live in either the particular or the universal. Um, we, we have, each of us have particular identities. We, we, each of us, you know, we are um, black, Jewish, Muslim, um, support Liverpool Football Club, um, watch um, Jean-Luc Godard films, whatever. The, the, we, we all have certain things that, that define, we think, define who we are. And we, mm. we kind of have those particularities um, from which we emerge. But at the same time, those particularities only make sense because we live in a broader society, in a, in a, in a, in a broader world, where um, one can reach across one's narrow particularities um, and talk to other people uh, and make common cause with other people. There's a distinction between identity and identity politics. We all have identities. Mm. Identities are, are crucial um, to ground us in this world, to allow us to relate to other people. But, the pol but politics should be a means of overcoming or going beyond the narrow sense of, 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 of identity that we all possess, of, of linking us across those identities. But in order to do that, you need to have that broader sense of politics, a sense of engaging with the world, and through engaging with the world, uh, finding that, that, um, that one's narrow identities isn't a sufficient way of understanding the world. Mm. That, um, and those, those broader um, uh, struggles, um, whether they're um, struggles uh, uh, of Lancashire cotton workers in, in, in the 19th century, of, of um, the Grunwick strikers and, and the support they had um, in the 1970s, uh, of the support that um, Ukrainian refugees have today, or uh, the campaigns against uh, uh, the, the, the oppression of Uyghurs in China. It's through those struggles that our particular identities become part of a, a broader, um, a, a, a wider uh, coalition, uh, a set of interests, a more universalist way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. But the opposite is always tr also true, that where um, politics frays, where politics becomes much more difficult to pursue, where the idea of a radical transformation of the world um, uh, uh, becomes le much less plausible, then we tend to retreat away from those universalist perspectives into uh, particularist ones. And that's really what has happened um, over the past um, half century. It's a point I was making earlier that, mm. that um, what underlines contemporary identitarianism is that sense of social pessimism, the belief that it's, it is impossible to radically transform society. Um, it's oh, interesting if you, if you go yeah. back to, if, if you take up an issue such as um, critical race theory, yeah. which, which is, a, which is a, a buzz issue today. And if you look at a figure like Derek Bell, who was, you know, in a sense, a founder of cr critical race theory, mm -hmm. his view was that racism was ineradicable, mm -hmm. that it was permanent. It could not be changed. And you can see that kind of argument in some, in a, in a kind of a writer like uh, Tanahisi Copes, for instance, um, who, who, who draws from that. Uh, and so that, I don't think anybody went as far down that kind of pit of existential despair as, as, as Derek Bell did. I mean, Derek Bell's well worth reading, um, but it, 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 he represents that view of racism as permanent and nothing to, there's nothing to be done about it. So when that happens, the question, if, if racism is permanent, if there is um, no way of challenging it or, or overcoming it, the question then is, what do you do? And at that, at that point, any kind of anti-racist activity becomes performative. 
because if 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 you're not going to tr actually transform racism, um, what you're actually doing is saying, let's make it a little bit better. Let's um, find uh, uh, something that allows us a greater recognition. Um, it, the, the sh it, there's a shift from wanting to materially change society to wanting to achieve greater recognition or greater representation. Um, and so, uh, or, or making um, white people feel guilty uh, and so on. And those are all the tropes that you, you see in contemporary uh, anti-racism. And so I see it as the, the product of um, trying to fight racism while feeling that you can't actually overcome racism. Uh, and so you, you end up having um, both uh, an identitarian, identitarian viewpoint and, and a kind of performative form of anti-racism. So, so you've said a few times now that pessimism is what's at the bottom of the recent turn towards identitarianism, is that people do not feel that it's possible to create a truly non-racist society. And so the logical option is just, well, listen, if it's, if it's a war of all against all, what is there to do but stick with your race, stick with your family and try to get the most, right? Indeed. That is um, an attitude many people have. For me, that, you know, what's, what's wrong with that is it really, it's an attitude that seems impervious to, to evidence, right? Impervious, impervious to change by changes in reality. So one of my, one of the most, uh, one of the examples I think about most often is the election of President Obama. So before Barack Obama was elected, and if you were to run the clock back to like 2006 or, or seven, what you basically heard was a chorus of people, um, a chorus of black writers saying he, he won't win, he can't win. And he, he won't win precisely because America is too racist to elect him. That's a prediction based on a theory of the country. Like any good scientist, when your prediction gets refuted, you're supposed to update the theory, right? So Barack Obama wins handily twice, uh, but the theory was never updated, right? W what, what actually happened is the second he won, the same people who were saying he couldn't win because he were, were too racist said, well, don't you go thinking that this actually means anything. We're still just as racist as, as we were before. Um which is uh which is to me an insistence an insistence on your pessimism in the face of contrary evidence it's a it's a proof that your pessimism is actually just a a commitment that you have regardless of how the world changes it's it's almost a part of your personal character um a psychological complex even like it's like it's not something based on or maybe maybe it's just based on this individual's experience of the world but um, the, the pessimism seems to me to be impervious to, to evidence. And it's also, I guess it's also worth commenting that it's, it's not a general, it's often not a general pessimism about the ability to change society, because often these are the same people that, that you would say, oh, well, we can get rid of the police and I'm optimistic that we'll create out of the ashes of the chaos, a, a beautiful, and peaceful society, which is a, a certain kind of optimism, right? So it's a pessimism really just with respect to the ability of, of the world to get beyond race. There are people that have, have, have accepted that that will never, ever happen. Any example of it seeming to happen, such as Obama get, getting elected, we are going to find some way in which this is actually not the optimistic punchline that you're looking for um you know and i've seen this over and over again and you know i'll give another example because you know the, i think these examples they just happen in the news and people don't actually grasp their true significance uh in america we now have juneteenth is a federal holiday which is which celebrates the true end of slavery uh when when slaves in texas actually received the news that slavery was abolished and that, that they were free I think it makes perfect sense as a federal holiday should have been one a long time ago because it is one of the most important moments in American history. But 
it's worth looking at, you know, what was said before it was a holiday and now how, what it is like after, right? Before it was made a federal holiday, you had, I think it was a USA Today article saying exactly the same thing people said before Obama was elected. There's, we, they basically said Juneteenth should be a holiday, but it's not going to happen because Americans are just far too racist. Americans do not want to acknowledge the real history of slavery, and it's going to be a huge uphill battle if it happens, and it just probably won't at all. You know, cut to a few months later, bipartisan bill passes Juneteenth as a federal holiday um, with n essentially no resistance. And it's sort of forgotten about, right? The whole cynical argument in advance is not tossed out the window. It's just recycled. Um, and, you know, we, we make all of these gains and then put them in our pockets as if they were not significant and, and the pessimism persists. Uh, this is a dynamic that I've noticed. And I'm curious if, if it's a dynamic you've noticed as well. It's, it's true. Um, uh, much of what you say, but it's possible to, to both to say that um, American society, British society, have are completely different now from what they were 50, 60 years ago um, when it comes to um, race, attitudes to race, uh, the place of black people and minorities in society and so on. Um, and that uh, the election of Barack Obama was a a symbolic uh, expression of that, a, a symbolic expression of how much American society has changed. But also to say, actually, it, it hasn't created... The, the election of Barack Obama did not create a post-racial world. That, um, in, in that sense, um, not that much happened. Um, uh, it was symbolically hugely important. Um, but in, 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 in material terms, uh, not that much happened. Um, and I think it's possible to say both of them because um, we, we, we can look at the important significance of Barack Obama, not simply in terms of his skin colour, um, but also the fact that he is a, a, a liberal politician of a, of a particular uh, viewpoint. Um, uh, and a lot of his views um, uh, are, um, are not radical in any sense. And so um, uh, it's possible to... Uh, uh, I think part of the problem is that um, those who argue that the election of Barack Obama changed things hugely are as invested in the idea of, 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 skin, of the importance of skin colour as those who say um, it didn't change anything at all. Um, and I think it's, uh, the, the point... Uh, the, 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 I suppose the, the thread running through our conversation has been that um, let's not get so obsessed with a question of, of race as, uh, as a category. Uh, there are other categories that are important. And the fact that you put, uh, that you have black people in positions of power in city halls, in police forces, um, in the White House, um, doesn't necessarily change things uh, whether we're talking about race or class sure yeah that, that i mean that's a drum i've been beating for a long time the the idea that to put a black person in a, in a position of power has any relation to what they are going to do for the black community right i mean this is this is one of those opinions that even the people that think they disagree with it don't actually disagree with it because the moment you start talking about someone like clarence thomas well, they'll be quick to say, well, that's a guy that's never done anything for black people. And then I'm like, wait, hold, hold on a second. Two seconds ago, you were saying we need to elect more black leaders and it's important that Kamala Harris is a black woman. It's like, well, what, what is the actual cash value of her being black other than some combination of her beliefs, values, uh, proposed policies? And if that's what we're talking about, well, let's just skip the race and skin color thing and go straight to those. That's always been my attitude, right? Even if you, even if your politics are an explicitly race first politics, right? If I'm going to say, 
basically I'm a one issue voter and my vote, my, my issue is what are you going to do for my community, whether that is black, Muslim, Asian, Latino, et cetera. And there are many people like that. Even still, you would want to simply really go to the policies and the beliefs and the values of a person uh, much more than you would the skin color. Um, I mean, this this brings up a, a kind of larger question or, or paradox of the conversation, which is, it seems to me what, you know, the values that you and I share are that race in itself is not a meaningful or significant trait. It does not tell me what you think. It does not tell me who you are. It does not tell me what you stand for. It doesn't tell me whether you're a good person or a bad person. It doesn't tell me whether your opinions are right or wrong. It doesn't tell me if you have a sense of humor or a sense of wit or um, a deep level of empathy, right? Like you could go on listing the hundred most important character traits of a human being and you wouldn't, you could not even get to race in, in, in the first hundred. Um, and it seems, in other words, it's a book written about race by someone that thinks race is not inherently meaningful. That's interesting because most people who write books about race write it because they think race is super meaningful. So I think we're both in the position of often talking about race, but from the perspective of you know, wanting it to matter less, not more, which is, um, w which I think puts us in the minority of people that talk about race. You know, there's a selection bias, right? The people that talk about race usually come into it because they're really interested in race. Whereas, um, you said something at the very beginning, which I, I resonate with, which is that as, as a very small minority in, in, in Britain, that was attacked for your race constantly, you could not help but think about race, right? But that's that's quite different than coming to it voluntarily, right? You, you, you sort of had to think about it as a matter, you were forced to think about it as a matter of everyday social life, right? But it's not inherently a, a fascinating subject to you, right? Like racial differences don't seem to be inherently fascinating to you and and so, and, and at least that's my perception. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And I've very much felt the same way as a, as a, as a half black, half Hispanic person in America. I felt like I never was very interested in the race of any of my friends or, or frankly, in my own racial identity, um, until I, I entered an environment where suddenly race is being talked about. It's, it seems like every fourth word out of people's mouths is identifying my race as a black person and recruiting me to racial organizations. And suddenly I now cannot help but think of myself in those terms because everyone is thinking of me in those terms. But it's not anywhere from an interest that I had intrinsically as, as a human being. So I'm curious what you make of being in the situation of, you know, a race writer that doesn't, doesn't think race matters, to put it too crudely. The way I look at it is that one can define solidarity or social affiliations in two kinds of ways. One can say that what matters are the values that people hold, their ideals, the kinds of society they want to build. Or one can say what matters is their race, ethnicity, culture, faith, and so on. And building solidarity is often, uh, there's an element of both in that. But to me, I would far rather um, make common cause with somebody whose views are, in fact, I, I would only make common cause with somebody whose views and ideals are similar to mine than somebody whose race or ethnicity or culture are similar to mine. And part of the problem is that we've shifted from the first to the second. Or rather, we've come to see um, that being black or white or Muslim or European or English somehow defines one's ideals, one's values um, about the world. And I, I, I'm trying to separate those two things out and say what matters are the values that you hold the ideals that you have, the kind of society you want to build, and not where you come from in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, um, 
history, heritage, whatever. Um, it's where you're going to that matters, not where you've come from. Mm. All right, Ken and Malik, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to the audience and the people at Intelligence Squared for setting up this double release podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. The book, One More Time, is not so black and white, available in fine bookstores everywhere. Thank you, Kenan.